We'd like to say a big thank you today to the European Proteomics Association, uh, to the British Society for Protein Research, to the Young Proteomics Investigators Club and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for all their help and support in setting up this webinar. We'd also like to thank the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network and the News and Proteomics Research Blog for promoting this event. We are also ex extremely grateful for Imperial uh, College L London Chemical Engineering Department for providing us with access to their webinar platform. And obviously a huge thank you to Christian for agreeing to help us begin this seminar series, which I'm sure is going to be a, fantastic, a fascinating talk. We're pleased to announce our next webinar in the series will be on Friday the 17th of April, and that will feature Dr. Pedro Beltreo, uh, talking about his work on the manuscript, a SARS-CoV-2 human protein protein interaction map reveals drug targets and potential drug repurposing. So today we are very lucky to have a talk from Christian Munk. Um, Christian studied biochemistry at the University of Tübingen and Max Planck Institutes in Martinsried and Tübingen. He obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge where he performed his thesis work in Anne Bertolotti's laboratory at the Laboratory for Molecular Biology. His graduate work focused on the folding and prion-like properties of mutant SOD1 in the context of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and earned him the prestigious British Neuroscience Association Postgraduate Award. After his graduation, Christian joined the laboratory of Wade Harper at Med Harvard Medical School with an EMBO long-term fellowship to study protein quality control in mitochondria, particularly the mitochondrial unfolded protein response. Christian started as an independent group leader in the Institute of Biochemistry in December 2016. His main research interests focus on mitochondrial quality control in particular in determining the process involved in the mitochondrial unfolded protein response and its role in human diseases. Today, Christian will be talking us through his manuscript, SARS-CoV-2 infected host cell protein MX reveal potential therapy targets. And with that, and hopefully no more technical issues, I will try and hand you over to Christian. Thank you for this nice introduction. I will try to get my screen going. So if you can't see it now, it would be the time to complain. But otherwise fine. Um, I cannot start a video of myself. I don't know what, whether it is possible or not. I guess you don't really need it to, to hear and see the talk, but one of the other hosts can turn it on if they want to. That, that would be an option. I have started, started recording it and we can hear you and see the slide. Good, perfect. And I hope you got the right part of me on there. I'm not sure where the camera is facing. Anyways, um, yes, I'm, I'm very happy that I have this chance now to present this work here. And the same as probably most of you, it's a bit unusual for me because it's the first time I'm giving a, a seminar of that size. I mean, you have these group meetings like probably all of you do. It's a different time and different technological ways to get there. But I present our work, um, really two parts of it, um, but mainly also focusing on SARS coronavirus 2. Um, be because I guess most of you are watching this on their screens and they're probably small. I tried as much as possible to make the images a bit bigger than usual, just so that it's easier to see. And yes. So from the talk itself, oh, just a moment, sorry, it's not advancing. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, there's really two parts of it. So if you only just came to hear about SARS coronavirus 2, that will be the second part and you can probably zoom out for another 20 minutes or so. But I thought it's, it's important to talk about those two parts because the first one is about us um, developing a new method or new approaches to, to acutely measure translatome changes. And this is exactly what we use then in the end to, to monitor SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So I thought it would be nice to get into that a little bit. And also for me, it's now nice because it's proteomics group. So I will focus a little bit less on the biology and then take the time to talk about the technical parts, which is really nice. You don't get to do that very often. And I think it's a, it's a good opportunity and hopefully for everyone, there will be a, a mix of it in there for you. So as mentioned, where are we coming from? And this is the biology side of it. In the end, um, we focus about cell stress, right? Cell is big, it has a lot of different compartments and functions, and there's a lot of different stresses that can hit it. They can come from externally, 
This can be environmental factors. It could be a fever, for example. But there's also stresses in the cellular compartments and the cytosol. And as mentioned in the introduction, what we also care about a lot is stress that's caused by a protein misfolding. And as a response, cell have um, a lot of different answers to that and stress responses they activate. And I just summed up um, a couple here. It starts with signaling events that often also lead to, can be major changes in transcription, translation, rewiring of the cell, changes in metabolism, cell cycle, and then many more things. Um, yes, and I think, so there's a lot of different parts of the cell one needs to understand. And a lot of these really require that you also get a global overview of what's going on during stress and also get a dynamic view of it, how it changes over time. Um, just short kind of two, three slides to that. Where I was coming from originally is, is questions of protein misfolding that lead to aggregation and that's um, common in disease like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and so on. And what that does to the cell misfolding in general is that there too, there are various stress responses in the different compartments that respond to that. And, uh, there's the famous ER stress response, for example, there's a heat shock response in the cytosol. And what we focus on most is this mitochondrial unfolded protein response. And to us, it's quite interesting because we know very little about this stress response. So there's really a lot to do. And I think this is, for me, one of the most important features of stress responses. And that brings us back to the technology to some extent, too. So if you have a stress response, these are usually rapid and they're transient. So the idea is you start with a stress, you get a response to that, and then it goes back into recovery, which is close to where you were originally. Maybe there's a little bit of fine tuning. So in the terms of a folding stress response, this is the time where you usually try to increase the folding capacity. That's usually done by transcriptional changes. And you try to reduce the folding load typically by just reducing translation. And I think the really important part is if, if you look at this curve in ER stress, for example, this takes about 12 hours, so it's pretty fast. So what that means is, is two things. Biologically, you need models where you can have um, a really a distinct stress where you can then follow the profile over time. But what's also very important is to have um, technology and methods available that allowed you to, to look at these different steps. And it's important to do that because if you look at a later time and wait for change to accumulate, you might end up here. And this is something well described for most of these stress responses, they become chronic. There might be compensation and you don't really understand anymore what was happening, but it can also lead to cell death, for example. So we need these models to, to study these aspects here. And we also need tools um, to allow us to, to monitor this in a time resolved way. And of course you can do qPCRs and Weston plots, but here we're talking about proteomics. What you really want is, is a proteomics way where, let's say, in one hour steps, for example, you can see um, how things change along this curve. Um, to get back a little bit to the mitochondrial unfolded protein response, um, I started with that a bit less than 10 years ago. And really what I found in mammalian fields that mainly of what we knew is that if protein misfolding occurs in the mitochondria, there's some form of signaling to the nucleus it induces a transcription response to try and overcome protein misfolding. So here now is a bit of summary. This is work from my postdoctoral time where we found different things that mitochondrial protein misfolding can also lead to a shutdown in mitochondrial translation. It changes metabolism quite extensively. And also and this is something still in progress too, and also shown by many other people is that there is an activation of the integrated stress response. And that is quite interesting to us in terms of dynamic cell responses. And I will explain to you in the next slide um, why that is so fascinating. But there's also a second part to that um, with mTOR. So mTOR is one of the central pathways in cells. A lot of stresses lead to inhibition of mTOR and one of the outputs is a shutdown in translation. So if we induce the mitochondrial UPR, so induce misfolding mitochondria, we lose phosphorylation of this um, substrate for EBP1, it's right downstream of the mTORC1 kinase. So indicating that there is mTORC1 inhibition. And also if we look at polysome profiles upon inducing my GPR, you can see in the red line here that there's much less translation going on and much fewer polysomes in conditions of the mitochondrial UPR. And the reason for us why that was fascinating is 
is the fact that um, the integrated stress response and mTOR are really two of the most central hubs in a cell that respond um, to stresses and adjust um, the cellular behavior. And this can really be a lot of stresses, whether it's folding, starvation, infection, and many more. And they really have um, huge changes uh, on the cells that they induce. Especially the integrated stress response is well known for massive rewiring of transcription. There are several major transcription factors being induced. mTOR is famous for inducing autophagy. And what they both have in common is they both lead to inhibition of translation. And the summary of the outcomes is really many things, but for me, I like to point out those two changes in metabolisms, really many pathways in the cell that change, and in proteostasis. But we really got interested in this translation part quite extensively. And there got a little bit complicated. So if you open a textbook and look into translation, cap-dependent translation, and the role of this stress response, you get something like here. So you need two complexes to induce cap-dependent translation. One is um, forming the ternary complex with a tRNA coming in in the 40S subunit. That will bind to the capped structure on an mRNA. And it needs to come together with a pre-initiation complex that binds to the capped structure on this mRNA. And if they come together, they can form a ribosome and start translation. And again, per textbook, it should be pretty simple. Integrated stress response leads to phosphorylation of EF2 alpha. So that happens here. So this step cannot happen anymore and all this should not be able to happen anymore. mTORC1, as I just showed you before, one of the substrates is this 4E here, binding protein 1. So mTORC1 inhibits these steps. So both of them should have the same outcome. However, if you now look in cells, what happens if you induce stress responses, um, it gets much more tricky to understand what's there. And I think some of that comes from the fact that the standard way still to, to look at changes in translation is to do ribosome profiling right? here, this riboseq. And the idea is there, you purify polysomes from cells, you digest the RNA, so only the, the mRNA pieces that are protected by ribosomes will remain. You create libraries out of that, do next generation sequencing and analyze what's happening. And people have done that many years ago already for mTOR, for example, and here's this one example. It's a, Nature paper from 2012 from the Sabatini lab. And what they showed here is that if you look at global translation by unbiased methods, and here it is um, 35S methionine incorporation, you can see that if you inhibit mTOR with TORIN1, you get a 70% decrease in global translation in the cells. And if you look at those polysomes again, you can see the same. They're nearly gone. So I think these. Um, things fit together. However, and this is now a ribosome profiling data, there's one thing that becomes very apparent, it's that the distribution is around zero. So essentially, most things wouldn't change. And this is mainly due to something that was, um, that's well known in the field. There's nothing wrong about that. It's just um, the general problems that can occur with um, normalization and next generation sequencing approaches. So here, and this is in a recent review from Ignolia, who is, is obviously one of the, or one of the two famous people about RiboSeq who developed this. And it says, in situations where we observe global unidirectional changes in expression, such as treatments that cause a global decrease in translation, this is exactly what we have here. These assumptions lead to in inaccurate quantification. And the assumption really is, and this is how the method works, you of course purify these polysomes and those, and then you put the same amounts into the experiments. But if biologically they're different, it's not so easy. And even if you try to adjust for that to some extent, um, there's so many PCR steps, there's just a normalization bias that it looks as if both were the same. And the outcome of that was, and it's a bit long-winded story, um, was that they cannot see this global rearrangements, but of course they are still um, a number of mRNAs that are going down. And similar studies were also done for the integrated stress response. And similarly, there two mRNAs were found, but it's only a very small fraction of, of all the mRNAs. So it doesn't reflect this 70% difference. And ultimately, what it really led to is that most people in the field believe that the integrated stress response and mTOR have different outputs in terms of what they control on a translational level. And this is mainly because these mRNAs didn't overlap. And I delved into this a little bit because this is one chance where we can say, um, I mean, 
next generation sequencing is always this method that people talk about it a lot and sometimes in proteomic side thinking where are we here there's a clear problem that can occur with next generation sequencing approaches and biologically it really brought some problems to us because as pointed out here in this review there's this belief that they're independent pathways with different outputs, but in the context of the tumor microenvironment and so on, it doesn't look like this. And it's really important to understand what those two pathways do to understand how you could use that um, for, for treatment options. So we thought there, there should be a way of using MASPEC to overcome that. And I have to do a short detour to introduce tandem mass tags to you for multiplex proteomics, because I will need that later for, for the methods when I introduce it. So the idea is just like a standard bottom-up proteomics. You extract your proteins, you prepare peptides out of that, and you can analyze them on the machine. And this tandem mass text, they're shown down here. The NHS esters, they're highly reactive towards um, amines. They, they label the, the, the N-terminus of peptides, and that will occur in every single peptide of your solution. And we have different of these um, tags. So it's a little bit like barcodes. They're different. You can have up to 16 conditions. And can determine later on which peptide came from one of these, which of these conditions. And what that allows you to do, you can pull them all together. One really fascinating feature is these labels are isobaric. So if you look at, at the first mass of those peptides from all these 16 different samples, they're all exactly the same. And only later, if you fragment the peptides in the machine to determine um, the fragments and in the end, the amino acid sequence, if you do that with HCD fragmentation, you kind of break this this TMT tag, and now you can find differences in the molecule. It stems from the fact that there's heavy isotopes in there. In the top of case, there's five over here. In the bottom one, there's five over here. The molecule altogether, this, the, the mass is the same. However, if you break it here, now you have this difference in the isotope. So it's kind of a neat tool to use. There were some issues with that in the past, and, and that mainly stemmed from, from something that was called ratio compression. And it's kind of shown here, if you, for example, take a yeast proteome and um, put a six flex experiment together with ratios 10 to four to one to one to four to 10. And then in three of them, you also bring in extract from humans. Um, what you actually measure in the machine is not this correct 10 to four to one ratio anymore. Instead you have ratio compression and the differences um, look less. But this is something um, that was already addressed quite a couple of years ago. And, the main reason for this compensation happening is because your isolation window, when you take out um, the first peak, you can also co-isolate other um, masses that are in there. And if those are peptides that also have TNT tags in there, of course, um, they can perturb the, the quantification that you get in the end. But that was largely solved already in 2011. Um, at least Ting and the Gigi lab. And that was just before it joined Wade Harper's lab, who's next door. So after that, we could really make use of this TMT method quite a bit. And there, the idea was to, to simply add a third step measurement during um, running those experiments. You, you still do a regular MS1 measurement of the peptides, but then you do a mild fragmentation that will not break the TMT signals, but it's enough to determine um, the peptide fragments and get the sequence. And then here, you, you isolate the peptides of uh, the, the masses, the peaks of interest to look then specifically of the breakdown of the TMT reporters to determine um, how much of the intensity came from which sample and to determine ratios um, towards each other. And this is summarized here. So if you use this MS3 method, um, you get very close back in this light blue towards what you're expecting where you don't have an interference, the ratios and quantification should get. So close to 10 to one, four to one and two and a half to one. Still important to say, even if you have this interference, um, it's compressed, but it still goes in the right direction. Just instead of 10 to one, it's four to one, instead of four to one, it's two to one and so on. So you don't get completely wrong results, but they're, they're strongly compressed. But anyways, that's where it was. And there were some other tools to use it. And then we thought, okay, is, um, how can we address now this translation problem by proteomics? And of course, people have been doing translation proteomics for, for many, many years. And this typical idea is that you take your culture at the time point zero and you replace your, your light lysines with heavy lysines. Yeah? So over time, the newly synthesized proteins should in, 
incorporate the heavy license and you can follow that over time and you can follow it for the different proteins and determine what are the translation rates. Now we get back to, to the introduction I gave to you and that was part of the reason why I did because I told you if you want to look at stress responses you have to look within a couple of hours. You have to see dynamically what's going on and to really see in a finely time resolved window what happens. And the problem there is that the median half-life of proteins is two days. So if we want to have this one, two hours resolved um, resolution, the labeling intensity we get is somewhere down here, which is essentially only a couple of percent per, pe uh, per protein or per peptide are heavy labeled. And it's very hard to detect that. And that's exemplified here. And first, I want to introduce Kevin Klan, who did all this work and also did the sars cov 2 a virus 2 work that I will show to you later. He's really a brilliant PhD student and I'm very happy to have him. And so here we get back to this range of what we can measure. So this is just a very regular silic experiment, however, um, mixing together of heavy peptides and light peptides so that we can um, very well control what the percentages of incorporation really are. And if you look at 0.1% to 10% heavy, so that represents this about two hour window down here, this is what you get. And I think what one easily appreciates down here is the quantification doesn't work very well. It's low incorporation ratios. And what's even worse in some ways, if you just look at the number of identified heavy peptides, it's very few of them. And the reason for that is here, um, is that of course you still have the light peak and you have the heavy peak. The heavy leak is a small part of it. And as it turns out in, in all the top, 10, top 20, and so on methods. Of course, you look for the highest intensity peaks, and usually the heavy peaks in these conditions, they don't pass because for everyone, there's still a light one. And um, what we found is you usually need at least around a close to 10% heavy ratio to be able to detect it. It's also an additional problem, which I found in my postdoctoral work, that even if the machine measures it, um, the typical softwares to analyze it, like PD and MaxQuant, they have problem of finding it. So I had to do it manually, spectrum by spectrum back then, to get some information out of it. But what we thought that there might be a trick, and that's combining, that's why I introduced it, um, TMT to it. And the idea would there be that you still have your regular samples, like up here, but using TM2, you add a boost channel. Yeah? So one channel that's completely heavy labeled, it has the same mass, it's isobaric, as I mentioned before, to the other samples. So you can have your nine samples here that would not pass you above the threshold, but the boost channel will do so. And then later when you quantify the TMT signal, you can still tell where the signal came from. And we tried this out. So this is a typical MEPROT um, workflow. So MEPROT stands for multiplexed enhanced protein dynamics um, proteomics that we use. And here it's again artificially mixed just as in the previous figure, but now put together in one pooled um, TMT multiplex, including a noise channel where there's no heavy label at all, and a boost channel with 100% uh, heavy label pooled together, and the average of that is 12.6% heavy labeled. And then we run this in kind of standard ways, LCMSMS on a Q-executive HF, and analyze that. What we do is we get the raw files, we run them through Proteome Discover, pretty normal ways, and then with the output, which is essentially Excel tables, we have a Python script that then normalizes um, the peptides towards each other across the TMT multiplex. And that's based on extraction of the heavy peptides that we're interested in, and we also subtracted the baseline. And what you get out of that is something that looks like this. Yeah? So just to remind you, this is what it looked before if you do a single pulse labeling T, uh, Silac. This is what it looks like with the um, MEPROT method. So you get very tight quantifications, even down to this very low incorporations. And also the variation up here is much less than there. And this is shown in one figure here. So the mixed heavy to total, we knew how we mixed it together. So that's the expected percentage. This is what we measure. And with MEPROT, it's pretty tight. And also, if you look at the variance, there's very little variance here in orange with MEPROT. We played around with this quite a lot, also looking at how much booster channel you would need to get the perfect signal in the end. More helps more. However, what also turns out is the more you put in, the more variance you get. It makes sense because then the ratio across the TMT channel is not so great anymore. If this one signal from the booster channel takes over so much. And there's two kind of nice side effects. So I also mentioned that we have a baseline channel 
So that with that, we can determine how much noise there is because that is fully light labeled. There shouldn't be a heavy signal. And what it turns out, because we use this and we can subtract the noise that we measure here for every PSM, our MS2 quantification is basically just as good as an MS3 quantification, which means um, we don't have to do MS3, we have more identifications and it's just faster. And this is really due to this noise subtraction that's shown over here, because if we don't do this noise subtraction, you can see here the ratio is actually not correct. It's with the noise subtraction that we get this nice range of expected ratios down here to, to measured ratios up there. So with that, we thought we probably have a system available. We tried it out in, in various ways. Here is testing artificially mixed samples. You can see that across a dynamic range of 0.1% incorporation to 80, it's, it's quite linear. We test it in cells, test, um, labeled for 15, 30, 60, and 120 minutes there, and we get the whole dynamic range. It's, because if we titrate with cyclohexamide, you can see that we get the whole range from 100% translation down to nothing. And there was a lot of biology coming now that I will cut very short. And we allowed us to look at many conditions. Here's one overview of 27 um, individual biological conditions. Um, this is all done in, in triplicates in the end, more than 5,000 proteins. So we can really get quite far now looking at a translation. And what we found is that it works for these problems that I mentioned to you before. So here's again this mTOR pathway and the integrated stress response. Um, mTOR is shown here. So our data globally shows you this 60%, 70% um, translation reduction that was also shown by other methods. The same here if we induce integrated stress response with Tarpsigartin, which activates ER stress. And now we can also really tell what is actually happening in those samples. And that's I think looks quite different from what we had before from the ribosome profiling. Yeah, so currently the way this is done, it's a nine plex experiments, nine samples. We need um, 100,000 cells per sample. It's for us really importantly much, much cheaper than ribosome profiling and our current record is about 8,000 proteins quantified. And we, we cross compared a lot with the ribosome profiling data that's available. Um, it looks quite good, but as I mentioned before, there's not many mRNAs um, found with ribosome profiling. For us, really importantly, what we found is that there's actually quite extensive overlap in the output of, of mTOR and the integrated stress response. And as I mentioned earlier on, it was not clear in the field what would be going on. So that was a really important point. And um, I will cut this short a little bit. We tried a lot of different concentrations of ISR activation, mTOR inhibition, and also general translation inhibitors. And what really turned out is all these, they don't cluster together by pathway, they cluster together by the extent to which global translation is being attenuated. So it is not a pathway specificity that drives which proteins have reduced translation rates. It is um, really intrinsic to the protein itself. And there's striking a lot of proteins that behave just like global translation overall. So if global translation disappears, they disappear. And it's probably a bit easier to see here, the behavior is really, there's different groups of proteins um, depending how strong the stress is, some react very quickly and go down, some later and some later. And there's even a lot of housekeeping genes that we never see to disappear. So a bit of a summary on that, if you look at basal translation and then activate the ISR or mTOR, it leads to a um, large shutdown of translation and it largely overlaps between those two pathways. And I think I, I kind of summarized that before already, there's also this technical points that now we have a way to highly acute measure translatome changes on, based on the nascent chain. So not the ribosome occupancy as with ribosome profiling here, you measure the, the nascent chain that comes out. We don't have this normalization bias here, need a few uh, little material. It's relatively cheap and we can achieve um, high throughput. And that's something we thought, okay, now we can go back to our stress responses and profile what's happening. We have something that's highly time resolved. It would be interesting to look, for example, what happens with bacterial infection or viral infection. And with this method, we really wanted to focus on translation. And we had a couple of projects running with viruses and bacteria. And then for us, February happened. And yes, um, COVID-19 was, was breaking out, spreading around the world. And for us more specifically, so I'm located in Frankfurt in Germany. We're very close to the airport. And really, whenever something like this happens, we're one of the first places where 
you get exposure to it, and it was the same here. There was this um, evacuation flight from Wuhan on February 1st this year, and there were about 130 people who got evacuated, and two of them turned out to have SARS-CoV-2, and then my colleagues that I had been working with in virology already on other virus projects, they um, managed to extract the virus from them and try to set up um, viral cultures. So they're, they're shown here. So it's around the group of um, Professor Yerendri Sinatl. There's Denisa and also Benjamin. And yeah, within just a couple of days, they managed to set up a way to, to get this, this virus in culture, to have it replicating in cells and to have a stable system for that. And what they used, so I mean, originally, and that's something for non virologists is not so, so obvious, is it's not like in general cell biology where you just take the, the cell you like most, the cell line. Um, cells have to be permissive for the virus, and a lot of the cells typically are not. So they tried out quite a few cell lines, I'm focusing also on CACO2 cells, which are colon helial cells, which have been used a lot in the past to study um, coronaviruses. Also by Rinders, for example, who in 2003 was one of the first people to manage to extract SARS, so SARS coronavirus 1, and get it um, in a replicative system in those CACO2 cells. And they work pretty well. You can see here in a mock control, they grow out. And if you infect them with the virus after 20, 24 hours, you start having um, yeah, cell death occurring and then release of viruses. And we, they monitor the, the system here by PCR, where you infect the cells with the virus, you wash and you look at different times. And here by PCR, you can see um, the production of the virus and release um, into the, the, the medium on top of the cell. So with that, we really had a system in hand to, to study um, how um, the infection process into cells and for us particularly, what is the host cell response, what happens in those cells when they get infected. So this is where Miprod came in because that's what we used. We used this patient, isolate the virus from, from a patient, infected this CACO2 cells, and used this MEPROD approach again to look at differences after two hours, six hours, 10 hours, and 24 hours. Harvested the protein, multiplexed it's, 10, uh, it's 11 samples. All this was done in triplicate, so it was three 11 plexes, fractionated them, and then shot them on the Q executive as, as before, and did all kinds of analyses with them. And just before I get into all the details there, I want to mention. We, that a lot of these um, data is, is available, right? So the, all the data will show you is available on this preprint. So if something is not clear, you can check it out there. Our data is also freely available on, on Pride. They even on their website have this nice link up there where no matter where you are, you can find our data set, but here's the identifier. And we also, I put up a section on my website that is particularly about coronavirus and has more information, direct links to the raw files, to the TNT labeling schemes, and also one dimension here is this interactive online tool. It's not super pretty, but if you don't want to look through tables or are very comfortable that it's useful, you can just type in the name of your gene and you will see um, whether we measured it and what the outcome was in changes in protein and translation levels. What we found across it, so this is translation data now, that things do change. This is principal component analysis about um, across all these samples. And the the important nice thing to see is that replicates cluster relatively closely together. There's three, here's three there, and here's different colors. Um, the real differences start occurring after six hours of infection. Yeah? So here's after six hours, 10 and 24. So this is really where things started happening. And there's just an um, example looking at the viral proteins to, to show that it really worked. These are the five that we could detect in the translatome. And you can see that translation increasing over time. Um, important to point out, this is not abundance, right? This is really the translation rate at any given time. So what that means, it's this increase means that the translation is actually still increasing. It's not just a protein level, but there's still something going on that makes these um, proteins being more and more efficiently or at higher rate being translated over time. Um, if you look more globally, the differences in the host proteome weren't that big. You can see here two hours, six hours, it's not much happening, then some things come up. But if you look globally at the average of that, um, this is the picture you get for the different time points. And to us, a little bit striking was that globally translation doesn't change much, except for this 10 hour time points where we reach a maximum of 23% 
changes in translation. So translation goes down. So there's not this massive shutdown in translation as some other viruses do where they try to shut down translation of the host proteome to use the machinery for themselves. And then we looked at what is actually from the host cell side increased in translation in a similar profile as the viral proteins are. And so it was interesting that there's really a lot of this translation machinery coming up. So it's not just that translation keeps on running. It means that the, the virus, in some ways, response to the virus means that there's more translation occurring. And we really wondered what that means, that the translation is not reduced and there's globally more of it, whether that means, or we had the hope that the virus might be more susceptible to translation inhibition in the cells to prevent replication of the virus. And this is what it, um, something we looked at here. So there's a couple of drugs that are known um, to, to help preventing viral replication in different kinds of coronaviruses. And we tried out um, two of them, cyclexamid, their examples here, and emetine. We tried these out in a dose response curve to look what happened at viral replication um, in the cell if we inhibit translation with these two different compounds. And as you can see here with the um, sub micromolar IC50s, we could prevent viral replication inside the cells by these two compounds. And then we went further and looked at the changes in, in the proteome. And again, in early times, there's not much happening. Um, but later on, after these 10 hours, so these are the triplicates for 10 hours, you can see that they're some massive, um, sorry, this is 24 hours, and before that is 10 hours, you can see that there is massive changes happening. Um, cluster one, that's what was going down, was actually not that interesting to us in the end. We put that in the supplementary. There's something about cholesterol biosynthesis, but we didn't focus on that much further. It's quite different for the things that go up. And again, it goes a little bit towards the direction of translation, but more specifically here, it's, it's about splicing and the spliceosome. And that was really quite fascinating um, because it had been known that, that the splicing machinery interacts with a lot of um, viral proteins. So there are a lot of interactions that have been described in the literature. So with that, we thought it might be interesting to look at a spliceosome inhibitor. So this is Bidenolite B, which inhibits SF3B1. And there again, looking at the CPE, so the cytopathic effect, we could see that if we treat cells with this compound um, during infection, that they cannot replicate in the cells anymore. The cells don't die, the virus doesn't spread to other cells. And one other aspect that was in here is um, TCA cycle. That we found just generally speaking a lot in carbon metabolism. And we were wondering whether we could um, inhibit glycolysis and to prevent viral replication. And for that we used um, 2-deoxyglucose, which inhibits um, hexokinase, prevents glycolysis, and also in our hands, prevents viral replication in cells. And that was quite nice because um, there were other papers for rhinovirus where they showed that in the mouse, even 2-deoxyglucose um, can prevent um, the viral replication. And then as a kind of last steps of analysis, um, we also looked again at the at the viral proteins that we could detect in the whole proteome, they're shown here. It's a couple more than we had with the translatome. Um, of course, they also increase over time. And again, we looked which proteins have a similar behavior, which host cell proteins have a similar behavior. And what really stuck out was um, in rectum analysis and so on, that there's um, changes in nucleic acid metabolism. This is not very surprising, of course. Um, the virus needs bases to, to replicate itself in its genome. And uh, we tested there again whether an inhibitor of these effects could prevent viral replication in cells. And we tested ribavirin. And indeed, again, with, a, um, with pretty low concentrations, um, this prevented viral replication in cells. And so ribavirin inhibits IMP dehydrogenase. So it goes towards um, guanosine. And it's already an approved antiviral um, treatment. So I think there's hope that there might be options to move on from that and develop um, generally treatment options for COVID-19. So I think we're coming also time-wise towards an end. Just to summarize what we found here, um, first we established an in vitro system for SARS coronavirus 2 replication using these CACO2 cells. 
we carried out translatome and total proteome proteomics. So again, we had this time-resolved analysis of what happens over time. We identified key cellular pathways modulated in the host cell upon SARS coronavirus 2 infection. And then ultimately we used inhibitors. So these are drugs available, a lot of them in clinical, preclinical trials or even approved to inhibit translation, splicing, glycolysis, nucleotide biosynthesis, and all that prevented sars cov 2 replication in cells. Um, that's what was there. Here's again, if you want to take a screenshot or something, of the link to the preprint if you want to look at that in a bit more detail, but you can also Google it. And with that, I come to my end. And I would really like to, to thank my lab and especially Kevin Klan, as I mentioned before, who really did all this work in this presentation. Um, others, I want to give a big thank you to the virology in Frankfurt with Rindris Sinadl, Denisa Boykova, and Sandra Zizek, and also Benjamin, who's a co first author on the paper, but he's not in the virology, but I put him there because he fits thematically. I want to say thank you to Wade Harper, who's my mentor during my postdoc, and I showed you a little bit of the MITE UPR work, so I wanted to point that out here. And Ivan Digic, who's the head of, of my current department, and is really just a great mentor, so I want to have him on the slides. Um, great thanks to funding from ERC and Eminuta mainly, and also these two awards that I won that really gave me the freedom to just shift some money to quickly go on this SARS coronavirus 2 research, some others. And here, if you need the link to my website to also find where the work files and things like that are and to the Twitter handle. So with that, thank you very much to you. And now I'm excited to find out how we do this question answer um, rounds now. Okay, can everyone hear me? Uh, right, I assume you can. Um, the way that we're going to approach this is twofold. Um, so, for those with questions who would actually like to ask them via your audio, uh, please use the question and answer function and just indicate that you're happy to ask that question over your audio with a star. That way, you can ask follow up questions if, if anything comes up and have a, have a brief discussion. Um, if you prefer for something simpler, um, please.